Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us. We'd love to have you. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 16. In our last lecture, we saw uh, the people of Israel gathering together to anoint Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Israel. But they wanted him to loosen or lighten their yoke that their, his father Solomon had placed on them. The people were being taxed. Uh, a lot of them were forced labor uh, to accomplish Solomon's uh, voracious building appetite. And Rehoboam went to consult with his older advisors. They advised him, you know, if you listen to the people and lighten their yoke a bit uh, and treat them fairly, they'll, they'll serve you. And then he went to the young school chums, the young advisors, and they said, tell them that your little finger is stronger than your father's loins, and Solomon chastised you with whips, but I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. You notice someone that, Sol uh, that Rehoboam didn't consult? He didn't ask God what he should do. And, but God took care of that. Uh, he sent Shemaiah, a prophet, and said, you're not going to fight against the, the, your brother, your flesh and bone, uh, your brothers of the tw ten northern tribes, Israel. So uh, Rehoboam, as we left off, had just fortified 15 cities in the southern part of Judah. I think he was anticipating an attack from Egypt, and that was pretty perceptive of him because we got one coming when we get to chapter 12. We also uh, had Jero excuse me, yeah, Jeroboam uh, became the king over the ten northern tribes. And as we ended our last lecture, we had the Levites and the priests were fleeing the ten northern tribes and moving to Judah and Benjamin. Why? Because Jeroboam had made a golden calf, two of them as a matter of fact, put one in Bethel, uh, one in Dan, and told the people, you don't need to go down and worship the Lord in Jerusalem at the temple. You can worship these golden calves. And the people, uh, the Levites and the priests were righteous. They wouldn't have any part of Jeroboam's golden calves uh, or his other uh, freedoms that he took with religion. He was playing church, making up his own religion as he went. So with that introduction, let's pick it up. Uh, we're going to go back with Jeroboam and the ten northern tribes is where we left off. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up. Second Chronicles chapter 11, verse 16, and it reads, and after them, after the Levites and the priests fled the ten northern tribes, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. They knew the law of Moses. Uh, they knew that, that Jerusalem is where God said, you will come and make offerings to me. And no doubt did they just not only come to Jerusalem to make offerings, I'm sure that they stayed and moved into Judah and uh, Benjamin, the territories controlled by them. Why? To flee from the uh, religious, uh, uh, what would you say, transgressions of Jeroboam is what we would say. Verse 17, so they, this being the priests, the Levites, and the righteous people who fled the ten northern tribes strengthened the kingdom of Judah. A nation is strengthened when the people are righteous and follow God. And made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong. 
three years, for three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. And they walked with God, in other words. And we see, start to see a pattern. Uh, David, the first part of his reign, uh, he was a very righteous, very pious king. He, he was a good king. It was in the second half of David's reign that he started making mistakes. Same thing with Solomon. Things went well in the first years of Solomon. Solomon then fell away to committing idolatry uh, due to his foreign wives and bringing their gods, Chemosh, Molech, uh, Ashtaroth, uh, into the Temple Mount even, and Solomon fell into idolatry. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, started off good the first three years. Uh, he's not going to reign as many years as his father or grandfather. He reigned 17 years, where Solomon and David both reigned 40 years each. But things were going good during that time period. It's not going to continue, unfortunately, for the people of Judah. Verse 18, And Rehoboam took him Mahaloth, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, to wife, and Abihail, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse. Now, a couple things on this verse. Nowhere in God's Word will you find Jeremoth listed in the genealogy of King David. Now, that would be some good stock, no doubt about it, uh, coming from David, but it's thought that Jeremoth was possibly a son of David by one of his concubines and therefore would not have been listed in the genealogies. Abihail, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse. That makes uh, Eliab, of course, that makes being a son of Jesse, that's David's brother. So the daughter of David's brother he would take to wife would kind of be out of whack as far as age is concerned. You see, David was the grandfather of Rehoboam. So uh, you would be two generations away as far as age is concerned. And those of you who have studied God's Word for any length of time at all, you know in the Hebrew language that there is no word for granddaughter or grandmother. And in this case, it's probably the granddaughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse. Uh, still very good stock. Verse 19 which bear him children, Jeush and Shamariah and Zaham. Now, these sons are listed in the order of birth. And these were the first, the eldest sons of Rehoboam, Jehush, Shamariah, and Zaham. I point that out for a specific reason. More on that in a moment. Verse 20. And after her, referring to Abihail, he took Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, which bare him Abiah and Atai and Ziza and Shilomith. Now, uh, the daughter of Absalom, again, we're talking about m m unlikely because of age. Uh, we're talking a generation, at least one generation, uh, older than what Rehoboam is. So again, uh, Maaka, most likely the granddaughter of Absalom. And of course, Absalom, one of David's sons. So we're talking good stock still. Uh, Absalom, the son of David, uh, who had a sister named Tamar. Uh, she was raped by Absalom's half-brother Amnon, and Absalom killed him for it. He ended up having to flee Jerusalem for several years because uh, of that incident with uh, Amnon. He would go on to return to Jerusalem and try to take the throne away from his father, David. There was a lot of uh, violence in David's family. And why? Well, God said there would be that the sword would never pass from David's house. And we see uh, generation after generation it was a violent house. Verse 21. And Rehoboam loved Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, again, the granddaughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. 
for he took eighteen wives and threescore sixty concubines, and begat twenty and eight sons and threescore daughters, sixty uh, daughters as well. And Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, it states that a king should not multiply wives to himself. Uh, and, of course, uh, Rehoboam couldn't hold a candle to his father Solomon in that department in that Solomon took 700 wives and 300, uh, 300 concubines. Verse 22, and Rehoboam made Abiah the son of Maacah the chief uh, to be ruler among his brethren, for he thought to make him king, and he would make him king in chapter 12, verse 16. But this is out of the order of things. I mentioned that the eldest son of Rehoboam in verse 19 was Jeush, and in the law, the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 21, verses 15, 16, and 17 states that, uh, that a man, whether he loves his wife or hates his wife, the firstborn is the firstborn, and to receive a double portion. And in the case of the king, uh, the eldest would be the rightful heir to the throne. But uh, Rehoboam showing favorites to his wife in that he loved her the most, Maaka, by making Abiah uh, the heir to the throne, the crown prince. Verse 23, And he dealt wisely, Rehoboam did, and dispersed all of all his children throughout all the countries of Judah and Benjamin unto every fenced city, and he gave them victual in abundance, and he desired many wives. I think he distributed his sons in particular away from Jerusalem uh, and situated them in the cities across Judah and Benjamin. But notice he provided them with victual, that's gifts, in abundance. And I think what he's trying to do is to keep them uh, happy so that they don't protest or question his decision to make Abiah uh, the crown prince, the heir to the throne, when he wasn't the eldest son. Well, trouble's on the horizon in chapter 12 for uh, the nation of Judah. Let's go with verse 1. Things, things were going well, we noticed in uh, verse 17, for the three years that they followed God's way. And God had a pet name for Israel when things were going well. He called them Jeshurun in Deuteronomy 32:15. And the problem with Jeshurun is that they're fat, dumb, and sassy. And they start looking at things and saying, look what I did with my hands rather than giving God the credit for his blessings. Verse one of chapter 12. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it's not written here how he forsook the Lord, but it is in 1 Kings uh, chapter 14, verse 22, and the following verses. He established high places, which were illegal places of worship. God said, you come to Jerusalem, to the temple, and Rehoboam allowed and established high places, which were sometimes they were places where they worshiped Yahweh, but it, again, it was illegal because of the location. It also states there in 1 Kings 14, 22, in the following verses that he worshiped images, and he had groves. He brought in sodomites, which are male and female prostitutes. Uh, he even had the Ashtaroth, which were, uh, the, used the male phallic symbol as a form of worship. So uh, he strengthened himself by the people who came into Judah and Benjamin who were righteous, the Levites, the priests, 
the people who wouldn't put up with Jeroboam's antics, but then he himself fell away. I hope you know how to strengthen yourself, and that's doing things God's way. The main lesson that I would like for you to learn from Chronicles is if you do things God's way, it can be proved time and time again, over and over and over throughout history. If you want blessings from God, do things His way. If you don't want blessings from God and you want to go off on your own, do it, but don't expect blessings from God. Verse 2, And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Why did Shishak, the king of Egypt, come up? Because Judah, the people, including Rehoboam, had transgressed against the Lord. You forsake him, he will forsake you. Shishak, by the way, and according to Egyptian history, was the first king of the 22nd dynasty in Egypt. But God can oppress you with your own people. He can raise up an enemy to oppress you. And in this case, God raised up Shishak to uh, cause terror among the people of Judah and Benjamin. Verse 3, with 1,200 chariots, a lot of chariots, and threescore thousand horsemen, sixty thousand cavalry. And the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt. The foot soldiers were so many they couldn't even be numbered. The Lubums, these are Libyans, and the Sukums, <clears throat> which literally translated means hut dwellers, and the Ethiopians. Ethiopians were uh, descendants of Cush. Uh, known as Cushites. Now, it had been well known that there was a lot of wealth in Judah and Israel altogether when David and Solomon were king. But uh, the Queen of Sheba, you remember, she came and Solomon gladly showed her everything that he had. And word had gotten around of the uh, thousands and thousands of talents of gold uh, silver was so uh, plenteous, it was like rocks in Jerusalem. And these uh, Lubum, Sukkums, and Ethiopians had long been allies with the Egyptians, but they still know of the wealth that's in uh, Judah, and they're out for the spoils of war. Verse 4, And he, this Shishak, king of, of Egypt, took the fenced cities which pertain to Judah, and came to Jerusalem. You remember those 15 cities in uh, chapter 11 that Rehoboam uh, provided uh, and stockpiled weapons and supplies? Well, so much for the defenses that man makes. They had lost their main wall of protection in that they had transgressed against the law of God. But here they came to Jerusalem and uh, these fenced cities, you remember too, Rehoboam had scattered his multiple sons and some of his daughters throughout those cities uh, so that he could keep them away from Jerusalem so they wouldn't lay claim to the throne. But they came running to Jerusalem in fear of Shishak very intelligently. Verse 5, Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam, and to the princes of Judah, Remember, that's where they fled to, it was Jerusalem, that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Did God say, I forsook you? No, you forsook me, and then I forsook you. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you as long as you don't forsake Him. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, God says, Thou shalt not worship other gods, for my name is Jealous. And that's Jealous with a capital J. Your Heavenly Father has feelings. Now, if you commit 
minor sins and you ask for forgiveness, he's going to hear you. And especially with the blood of Jesus Christ having been paid on the cross, we can uh, claim grace. But I tell you, when you commit an, uh, an act of idolatry, your Heavenly Father has a hard time forgiving that. Why? Because His name is jealous. You're His child and you have forsaken Him when you start worshiping other gods. Those who worship the Antichrist in the not so distant future are going to be in the same boat. Verse 6, Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said, the Lord is righteous. This word righteous in the Hebrew is tzaddik. Uh, very, that's probably the same word from which zadok is translated in the King James Version Bible. And it means just uh, or right. And this is a good thing that Rehoboam and the others of Jerusalem are doing. It's important to humble yourself. And God recognizes that, and, and if you humble yourself, Jesus taught many times in the New Testament, God will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, prepare to be abased or brought low. Verse 7, And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak, God's grace. They deserved what they had coming, which would be to be destroyed by Shishak, but God saw that they humbled themselves. They repented, if you will. And, and God saw that and it touched him and he eased the punishment that uh, he had intended for uh, Jerusalem and the nation of Judah. But at this point, it isn't too late for them. And at this point in time, I don't care what you've done in your life, that you may have sinned uh, more than most, but it's not too late at this point in time for you to humble yourself before the Lord to repent, to ask for his forgiveness, and he will deliver you also. Verse 8, Nevertheless, Shemaiah the prophet continues with the word of the Lord, they shall be his servants, referring to Shishak, that they may know my service or my works, the Lord speaking, and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. What this is saying is, they didn't want me, to, the Lord, to be their king. They think that the Lord oppresses them. What God is saying here is, if you think I oppress you, let me put you under the thumb of Shishak, king of Egypt, for a while, and let you figure out what real oppression is. Verse 9, So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, talents upon talents, thousands of talents of gold and silver that had been accumulated over the years from the time of Moses in the house of the Lord, the treasuries taken by uh, Shishak, the Sukkums, the Lubums, and the Ethiopians. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Verse 10. Instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. We're talking about royal bodyguards. But Solomon, there was so much gold coming from Ophir uh, every three years that gold was so plenteous that he covered the shields that the bodyguards around the temple uh, and the palace of the king would utilize. Well, they stole those and Rehoboam, uh, being used to the pomp 
and the uh, show whenever he moved about. He liked to be escorted everywhere he went in Jerusalem, uh, but they had to make shields of brass. Now, brass, as most of you know, is a lot less valuable than gold. I think Solomon uh, would have been ashamed. Verse 11, And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, I would hope that he was doing that quite frequently at this time. I know I would have been under the circumstances. The guard came and fetched them and brought them again unto the guard chambers. Again, every time he went somewhere in Jerusalem, he made a big show of it and had his bodyguards uh, fetch their shields of brass to escort him. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him. Exalt yourself and be abased. Humble yourself and be exalted. That he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah things went well. In the Hebrew this is, and yet in Judah there were good things. Well, what good things were in Judah and Benjamin? Well, you had the Levites and the priests there. Uh, you had the righteous people who wouldn't put up with Jeroboam's golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Um, so that's the reason that things, there were some good things to be found in Judah. Verse 13, So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned for and reigned after humbling himself and the nation. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonite Tess. Now, Jeroboam would reign for twenty-two years and not only did Jeroboam uh, outlive Rehoboam, uh, he outlived also uh, Rehoboam's successor, Abiah, by two years. He outlived Rehoboam some five to six years. Naamah being an Ammonitess, uh, remember his father Solomon took a lot of foreign wives. Uh, he also took on the gods of the Ammonites, Chemosh, uh, related to Molech worship. Uh, Ammonites and Moabites, of course, were Adamic peoples in that they were of Lot, uh, both by his own daughters, uh, but being of Lot, the Lot was Abraham's nephew, so we're talking Adamic peoples. Verse 14, And he, Rehoboam, did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. And this prepared as he didn't fix his heart or his mind to seek the Lord. He got off into idolatry on his own. First Chronicles uh, chapter 28, verse 9, some of the last words of advice from David to his son Solomon, who was the grandfather, the father, I should say, of Rehoboam. Seek the Lord and you will find him. If you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Verse 15, Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah the prophet, and of Edo the seer concerning genealogies? And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. Now, these weren't out and out actual wars in that God sent Shemaiah to Rehoboam and said, you're not going to fight against your brother, your own flesh and blood, uh, bone, uh, the ten tribes of Israel. That th what this did refer to was there were hostile relations uh, between Israel and Judah at this time. And some might say, well, where is this book of Shemaiah? Well, we're reading it actually. The word book here in the Hebrew is debar, and it means the words. And we, we are learning the words of Shemaiah the prophet as we study the book of Chronicles. Verse 16 to conclude the chapter. 
And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And Abiah his son reigned in his stead. Why was Abiah? Because Maaka was Rehoboam's most loved wife. Again, he skipped over uh, the rightful heirs to the throne and promoted Abiah. Now, Abiah, we're going to learn in the next chapter uh, that Jeroboam also had a son that was named Abiah. Uh, many of you probably recognize the name Abiah from the 24 courses of the priest, for it was the eighth course of the 24 courses that was called Abiah. And it's through understanding that course and the corresponding dates that Abiah would have appeared on the Hebrew calendar that we're able to determine uh, first the conception date and birth date of John the Baptist. And therefore, since John the Baptist was six months elder than Jesus Christ, we can determine the conception date and birth date of Jesus Christ as well. <clears throat> In chapter 13, uh, we do see uh, Jeroboam and Israel uh, in out and out war. And I'm getting the out of time signals, so I guess that's probably a good place to stop for today. And we'll come back and cover the war between uh, uh, Abiah and Jeroboam and see how that turns out in our next lecture. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive format. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the Internet somewhere around the world other than the U.S. and Canada and unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in. Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need a telephone number. You don't need a telephone. I encourage you to talk to your Heavenly Father. I really don't think you have a lot of competition these days. And He always has time for you. And I know people think, well, gosh, He must be so busy because He's got all this responsibility and everything. He always has time for you. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, He's your Father. You should talk to Him like He's your own flesh Father. It's, the closest relationship that you have. And you should develop that relationship. How do you develop it? By talking to Him in prayer. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask You to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, addictions to drugs, uh, financial difficulties. You know, Father. If it is Your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name, and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the minds of folks. First up today, we have Nancy in California. <clears throat> I just watched your show for the first time. 
I was introduced to you by my brother and sister. I am a Christian. And my question is, is it wrong to, one, buy uh, lottery tickets, uh, play bingo, gamble uh, at the casino? My friends and family members who are carnal Christians, I don't know what a carnal Christian, feel that it is okay to gamble because there are many other sins that can send us to hell. Well, we teach here at Shepherd's Chapel that uh, if you find gambling entertaining and you have entertainment money uh, burning a hole in your pocket, have at it if you enjoy that. Uh, don't, however, spend junior's college fund or next month's grocery money or next month's rent uh, because you've got an addiction to gambling. That's, that's not fun, that's dangerous. Paula in Alabama, how does the light overcome darkness because it seems a lot of times that the darkness seems to win? Praying for you and your staff. Well, thank you for your prayers. We, we feel your prayers. I believe that the one-third who followed Satan in the first earth and heaven age are on earth right now. And that would be fitting because they followed Satan in the first earth age, uh, Revelation chapter 12, the first five verses will back up what I just said. Um, uh, but um, I, I, the Bible tells us that we're going to live in perilous times, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 in the following verses tells us that we're going to live in perilous times. And I think it's because those one-third that followed Satan in the first earth and heaven age are here on earth. I'll give you another scripture might help. Luke chapter 11, verse 34, the light of the body is the eye. Uh, if your eye is clear, your body is full of light. But if your eye is evil, your body is full of darkness. So make sure your eyes are clear. How do you keep your eyes clear? By staying in God's Word. Patricia in Georgia, what does this phrase in the Bible mean? Uh, the man's heart will fail them. The men's heart will fail them. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32 is one of the places that it says, and David uh, said to Saul and Israel, uh, let no man's heart fail because of him, referring to Goliath. And what he meant, meant was don't let anyone be a coward because of Goliath. Uh, be courageous, not cowardly. Your heart to fail is meaning cowardly. Donna in California, <clears throat> where was Jesus crucified? Well, it's Matthew uh, chapter 27, verse 33 tells us uh, the place is known by many different names. Uh, Golgotha, which if you translate it rather than transliterate it, means literally a place of the skull. Why did they call it the place of the skull? Well, likely to the number of crucifixions that were carried out there. Uh, it's also called Calvary. Uh, it's also known as Mount Moriah. Charlie in Pennsylvania, why do you get baptized? Well, because Jesus is our example and he was baptized. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 13 and the following verses. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter tells us that, that, that instructs us to be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So if you want to uh, get rid of your sins, uh, repent and be baptized. Now, you're going to sin again. I wish it was so easy that when you got baptized that that mean that you no longer would ever sin again. But once you're baptized, don't feel like you, once you're saved or baptized, don't feel like every time you sin, you need to be baptized again. Uh, Paul teaches us in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4, 5, and 6, to do that is like to re-crucify Jesus Christ again. Uh, that's why we have repentance. So you don't need to be baptized when you sin. Repent. 
George in Florida, I'm a drinker of alcohol, will I be forgiven and go to heaven? The first miracle that Jesus performed was uh, changing water into wine. Uh, and 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23 tells us to drink a little wine for the stomach's sake for your oft infirmities. Uh, whether you end up in heaven is entirely between you and the Lord. Nick in Texas, what is Mystery Babylon in Revelation? Well, Revelation chapter 17, verses 3, 4, and 5, Mystery Babylon is the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Uh, she is the queen of the Antichrist. She represents all those who worship the Antichrist and are spiritually in bed with him when he's here and his role as the Antichrist. James in California, the meek shall inherit the earth. What does this mean? And that's found in the uh, Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 2 and the following verses. I believe uh, it's verse 3 that states that the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek well, it states there, blessed uh, are the meek. And in blessed, you could translate it, how happy uh, are the meek. And the meek are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, God likes humble people, not arrogant people. Uh, our lesson today bears that out. Uh, Judah and Rehoboam were messing up big time. They were committing idolatry. Uh, and God sent uh, Shishak to destroy Judah and Benjamin. Well, what happened? They humbled themselves. And Jesus saw, excuse me, the Lord saw that and uh, pulled Shishak back from destroying them completely. Leave it at that. Linda in Texas. Was the family I have in this earth age the same as the first earth age? Was I the mother of the same children? No, you weren't the mother of children in the first earth and heaven age. You see, there was no womb in the first earth and heaven age. There was no human flesh in the first earth and heaven age. Now, there were souls, angels, if you will, uh, in a different body. Uh, but God, God for sure knows which souls go into which body. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 proves that with any, with beyond any shadow of a doubt. When God tells Jeremiah, I knew you before I placed you in your mother's womb and ordained you to be a prophet. Janet in Georgia, when God speaks to us, how does it come to our mind? Well, the Lord can speak to us in many different ways. Uh, God often appeared in the Old Testament uh, to people in dreams, and I think he still does that as well. Um, he also sent us the prophets to communicate his will to the people. Uh, today, we have the letter that he wrote to us, the Bible, which includes the words of the prophets uh, that he communicates to us through that letter. If you take the time uh, and the trouble to read that letter that he wrote to you. And it tells you how to be pleasing to him. It tells you how to receive his blessings in that letter. Charles in Pennsylvania. What happens if the earth ends but we find life on Mars? What about the Martians? Well, life on earth I'm glad to inform you, does not end. In fact is, heaven will be right here on earth. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 and the following verses tell us that the earth is going to be rejuvenated. It's going to be put back just like it was when God created it millions and millions of years ago. Uh, heaven will be here on earth. Gary in North Carolina was Judas Iscariot sent to hell? Uh, this is from Gary in North Carolina. Uh, no one is in hell at this time. Uh, now, there are 
two sides of the gulf in paradise. And I'm speaking of Luke chapter 16. Uh, when we die, you go to one side of the gulf or the other. Now, in Matthew 27, verse 3, we learn that Judas Iscariot repented. Now, whether the, the Lord, who is the judge, uh, and gives salvation to Judas is entirely up to the judge, and I'm sure uh, what Judas did as far as repenting. Um, leave it at that. Denise in Florida. I lost my son two and a half years ago in an automobile accident, and my fiancé took his own life in March. The grief is overwhelming to me. Where in the Bible can I read about how to deal with the pain? I know they are with the Father, but the pain doesn't go away. I feel lost. Please help. And I love the Lord and all of you. Well, thank you, and we love you as well, Denise. And we're, we're sorry for the loss of your son and your fiancé. You know, a loss of a child is out of the ordinary order of things. Uh, children usually normally uh, bury their parents. Parents usually don't bury their children. And when that happens, I think it's uh, an extremely traumatic experience. But uh, I want to give you 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, uh, Denise, where we learn that uh, nothing is, is going to happen to you that's not common to man. That means nothing's going to happen to you that hasn't happened to other people before you. But God will never allow you to be tempted or tested above that which you're able to handle without providing you a way out. Robin in Virginia, why are these people coming up with this flat earth theory? This is getting widespread in Christian circles. My wife, uh, Marion, took a phone call. She works for Shepherd's Chapel uh, is, is, and, for, and was on the phone one day and she got one of these flat earth believers on the line and she listened to them for a brief uh, period of time, a minute probably, and she said, let me take a wild guess you don't get the NASA channel at home, do you, on your cable network? And uh, the Earth is quite obviously round. I don't know where this uh, flat Earth theory is coming from. Herman in West Virginia. What do you think about women preachers and where in the Bible can I read about this topic? Well, I think uh, Deborah and Huldah in the Old Testament were fantastic uh, with God's word. The, the high priest and the king, they found a copy of the, Masra, uh, the uh, Torah in the, the temple and they read it and couldn't understand it. Who did they take it to? They took it to a woman, Huldah, and Huldah explained to them what the Bible said. Uh, I'm sure Philip's four virgin daughters in the New Testament were fantastic preachers as well because they prophesied. They were prophetesses. Um, I think when God pours out His Spirit on His sons and daughters, as it's mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, also in Joel chapter 2, 28, that they will convince even the gainsayers. Christina in California, those who know the Lord and don't walk in His ways, will they be deceived at the sixth trump when strong delusion is sent, 2 Thessalonians 2.11, that they believe a lie. And there's going to be a bunch of them, Christina. We learn how many in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, all that dwell on the earth except those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to worship the beast. That's the Antichrist. And of course, those written in the Lamb's Book of Life are the elect. They will witness against the Antichrist. And as I said, when the Holy Spirit speaks through them with that cloven tongue, when God pours His Spirit out on His sons and daughters, even the gainsayers will be convinced. Vicki in Texas, 
if, if we are covered by the blood of Christ, how come you teach so much Old Testament if we're covered? Well, much of the Old Testament are types for today. Uh, the king of Babylon, for example, is a type for the Antichrist. Um, much of the Old Testament is prophecy that has yet to come to pass. Uh, reading and studying the prophecy that hasn't come to pass as yet is like reading tomorrow's newspaper. That's why we study. All of God's Word is to be studied. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean that uh, we start with the book of Matthew in the Bible. If you have a Bible, a King James Version Bible, the first chapter is Genesis, not Matthew. Billy in Arizona, why is it a sin for two people who love each other to live together without being married? Well, in God's eyes, uh, a man marries his, a woman when he spreads his skirt over her. That means when they have intercourse. Uh, young couples, uh, our teaching here at the chapel is that if children are a possibility that you should obtain a civil marriage license. Why? Well, uh, if when you marry, if children are possible, uh, a civil license protects the rights of all parties involved, including the children, if the marriage ends up in a divorce. I'm talking about child support. Chandra and uh, Sandra, I should say, in California, how did Paul die? Well, it's not biblical, but uh, some historians believe that Paul uh, was beheaded uh, in Rome by Nero in the great persecutions of Christians in A.D. 67 or A.D. 68. Teresa in California, in the days of Noah, will the fallen angels look like giants or demons? No, they're going to look like uh, good-looking rascals. <clears throat> they will deceive and seduce many who are unsuspecting and don't know that they are coming. What you're talking about is the third influx of the Nephilim, the fallen angels. The first influx, what did they do? Genesis chapter 6, uh, they came to earth, they saw the daughters of, of Adam, and they went into them. It's going to be the same as in the days of Noah, uh, when, uh, uh, before, just before Christ returns. Uh, you follow with the second question, how about the giant bones that were found? Do you believe there is science that are wanting to reanimate them like the woolly mammoth. Well now, what you're talking about there, dinosaurs and behemoth, mammoth, many of those were alive in the first earth age. Man was not alive in the flesh in the first age, but the dinosaurs were. Uh, you follow, once again, the angels that are bound, are they in the earth? No, they're bound in heaven. Uh, but the, Jude uh, chapter 1 verse 6 tells us that uh, they are coming back, though, as you suspected. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 verse 6 in the following verses. Michael and his angels war against Satan and his angel. Michael prevails and boots Satan and his angels out onto earth. And it's woe unto you on earth. Better have your gospel armor on. Eddie in Idaho. Were we created with tails, and are we from monkeys? I don't believe this, but I have a friend that does. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in the following verses, God said, Let us make man in our image. We're created in the image of the angels. Uh, they never had tails, and neither do we. Evolution is false. Uh, if it were true, we would have example, examples continuously of evolving species. We don't have that. Everything is just exactly the way God created it. God created monkeys. They're still monkeys. God created man. Man is still man. Evolution is false teaching. 
Uh, in other words, if, when I say evolution, if we, that were true, we would have uh, be examples of something that's halfway in the process between a monkey and a man. We don't have that. You have monkeys, you have men. Greg in California, should we treat people who commit suicide any different than people who believe uh, or don't believe in God? How should we treat people who commit suicide? I'm not sure what you mean, how we should treat. I don't know. We in the flesh uh, can't uh, treat someone who commits suicide in any way. They're not here any longer. Um, you know, there are, they are in a different dimension than we are in. So uh, now it's salvation, if that's what you're talking about, that's between them and the Lord. Charles in Texas. When the uh, true Christ shows up, will we look like we did when we were in our early 30s in our spiritual bodies? Thank you and your staff for teaching the true word of God. You're welcome. Yes, I believe all angels uh, will look young uh, in appearance, Mark uh, chapter 16, verse 5, uh, the angel that had rolled the rock away and was present when the women showed up at the tomb when Jesus had already risen uh, was a young man. I think all angels are probably young men. And I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you very much because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You make a little time each day, to a special time, to uh, sit down with the letter that God wrote to you and study it. I want you to know that that makes God's day. You know, many of His children don't have time for Him today. They're so busy in the ways of the world uh, that they lose focus. They, they don't even know their Heavenly Father. They're lost. But it makes His day when He sees you, and when you make His day, He's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others as well. Most important this, though, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.